The most common frustration that we all have as software engineers, I mean, at the top, it's going to be dealing with technical debt. And that's kind of, you know, a fluffy term to describe just basically projects that haven't been maintained. And for some reason, maintenance just goes by the wayside um, whenever companies are losing money or whenever there's restructuring or whatever, whenever there's any of that stuff happening. Maintenance is always the first to go. And it's like your car. You know, if you don't have money, if you don't have money to maintain your car, you're still going to drive it, but you're just going to leave that light on. I mean, we've all done it, right? We've had, you know, we've had a light on for months, right? But, you know, it's working. It's still working. You know, it's still going fine until it's not. <laughs> until that inevitable day, you're going to get in your car and the battery is going to be dead. You, your your engine's not, just not working. Your transmission, you go to shift and doesn't nothing happens your car doesn't move it happens to i mean it happens to everybody but putting off that maintenance uh might have invited that problem to happen sooner and the same thing is with software i think the greatest way or framework to look at software development is in terms of a shop a mechanic shop if you ever taken your car to a mechanic, they're gonna they're gonna give you the rundown of what you, you know the problem is. They're gonna, you're you're going to explain, hey, like I'm kind of noticing this sound. I'm kind of noticing like you know something's not right here. They're gonna look at it and, and come back with you at it with an estimate and how much they think it's gonna cost. And it's it's an estimate, right? They say like, hey, you know, like you're probably gonna need like this part or that part, and we think it's gonna take like a week or you know a few days, whatever it is. Um, but again, it's an estimate. So it's like, if it takes longer, that's to be expected because it's an estimate. If it takes shorter then that, you know, that's just a nice surprise. The same thing in software development, you know, people, people want software engineers to give like these super precise estimates and agile is supposed to help with that. No, it doesn't at all. It's still an educated guess at best because the thing that you encounter is technical debt that nobody has taken into consideration, right? Let's say, for example, you have to do something that's only available in .NET 8. Well, you, you, you upgrade from, I don't know, maybe you're lucky and you're already on .NET 6 and you just need to bump to .NET 8. Well, guess what? The thing that you need in .NET 8 is only available in entity, in, uh, entity framework version eight. And guess what you're using? You're using a really, really old uh, database. And the, the version that you increase in entity framework now has a breaking change that you can't use with your old database. So do you upgrade the database? Well, if you upgrade the database, who knows all the cascading problems you're gonna have with that? Because you might have, I, I don't even know, you might have these old packages that act as connectors to that database. This happens all the time. It's just a cascading effect. And they're like, well, it's, you know, it shouldn't be upgrading the version be pretty easy. No, that's like the hardest thing. And forget about it. If you're on a, if you're on .NET 5 or before, you, you, <laughs> you better make sure that you understand all the breaking changes that have been from .NET 5 up to 8. But that's the thing. You know, it, people see that, oh, well, the application's working. Why do we have to... Why do we have to change anything? Well, your car is working, but it's got lights on. Well, why do you have to fix it? Well, it's, it's the same principle. It's the same thing. I wish that software. I wish that software engineering was was only was was just looked at exactly how car shops function. I think that's how it should should, should be looked at. And in terms of the allowance for creating time to maintain things is absolutely essential. There should be dedicated sprints for just maintenance alone because maintenance, I get that it's an expense, right? Well, you know, why can't we push this off for another year if we can get all this money from another year without having to put the maintenance costs into it? Well, okay, but what if you just put off your getting your transmission fluid changed for another year? Your transmission is probably going to be fine, 
oh, but guess what? You got all the you got some grinding gears eight eight months into it, and all you got all these uh, shards of metal floating around there, and then you just shot your transmission. But you got eight. I mean, so it's it's the exact same thing. Okay, well, what if there's a breaking change that introduced an independency? <laughs> you know, you're gonna have the same problem, and this is why it's such a but it's such a tough sell because software engineering as a whole is just looked at as a very very large expense for the company but you know they use our products or systems whatever it is to to get a lot of money and a, a t tremendous amount of money is made off of stuff we make but the upkeep and the maintenance is the part that is absolutely critical and should be like Priority number one for our teams as engineers, right? Whoever whoever is in charge uh, in terms of the engineers, I think really needs to push for true maintenance and true uh, updating of the, all the dependencies to whatever the latest version is that is supported. Now, where this gets a little tricky is if you're working in really old stuff you know, really, really old legacy code that maybe somebody who's been there, you know, 30 years wrote all these custom packages and then, you know, but, oh, but guess what? They're retiring and then they're taking all their, you know, their head knowledge with them. And then somebody's got to come in and figure out what's going on, right? Like it happens all the time. And that's why, that's why you see so much of this old legacy stuff just floating around is because, the person who made it is still there, and it's getting very, very difficult to hire for these old languages that are still being used. I mean, very difficult. I mean, if you ever try, I mean, look how many systems are still working on COBOL. I mean, it, there's large companies still use mainframes. I mean, it's this like it, you, do you know that, right? Like, it's just crazy. Or VB.net, VB is still floating around everywhere. I mean, every every place has some remnant of of that i mean everywhere i mean to get get an internship at, at big at large companies you'll see how much stuff is still used and how, how out of date and how brittle the systems are oh i mean if you ever yeah just but nobody learns those things so well what, what do we do we just put push off the maintenance because it's still functioning but you know we could probably get this out no it's like we have to figure this out or we have to update it at least to be a maintainable uh, state, and it, it's 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 not just as easy as going in and main, updating the dependencies. So I, I I know, but if we have a common frustration, I'm looking at the the Stack Overflow survey at 62.4 percent uh, of the responses of 28. 1,251. So the amount of technical debt is the most common frustration at 62.4. 30. The next highest at 32.9 said the complexity of the tech stack uh, is, is the next most common frustra frustration. I would argue that the technical debt makes it extraordinarily complicated because technical debt forces you to write all this complex this obscure code to handle, to accommodate situations that are already solved for in later versions of frameworks or libraries. And the worst spot you can be is spending weeks and weeks solving a problem that's already been solved in an updated version. And that's not a good spot because it makes for bad code that's unavoidable. Sometimes, you know, it's easy to be critical of code when you're coming into a system and you're and you're learning it but i guarantee that in five years down the road if you look at your own code you're going to be just as critical as your own code sometimes it's not in our control to write the best clean code every time be, just because we're dealing with these systems that have so much technical debt that we have to write this weird you know code to accommodate something that's lacking and we have to write these connectors and we have to write you know this weird state management to handle it's just you you've you've done it we've all done it and but it makes the product work and it gets the it gets whatever they want in there but the maintainability just plummets because it's it's just like 
a lot of that code, you know, is is made, or I should say, is highly dependent on the the very specific thought processes of very specific business logic in the moment, and it makes it challenging to debug. Another aspect of why technical debt is challenging is often in deployments. If you work in lo- if you especially if you work in large monolith applications. Especially if they're old, deploying them, let alone running them locally. Oh my goodness! I mean, good luck. That's why it's it can be very challenging, especially if build times are very high and they rely on a lot of external services. Because then you have to mock so many things, you have to get so many things running in uh, locally, have it all connected and running, and then you got to get data into this. And then it's just it's a whole mess. And technical debt just adds to that problem because it makes it so much more complex to deploy, not only to production, but just get just run locally and debug, right? If you're if you're limited in how you debug your own application, it makes it it's so frustrating. That's why a lot of people leave and find new jobs is because of that, because of poor developer experience. And so if the original person is left, and you get a team of people who come in. And also don't want don't want to work on it, and then they leave. Well, then what do you do? Well, you just <laughs> your turnover rates can be real high, and you're going to get a lot of people coming in, adding into the adding onto the system, and putting band aids, but not really solving it. And technical debt makes systems very very complex. Again, not by not unfortunately not sometimes not by choice. And from the business perspective. You can't just make a new app, right? Like you, it's not, (laughs) you can't just, you can't just replace it. You have to put these switches in to turn stuff off or on. You have to do a slow rollout to uh, a small group of people. You know, we've all been, you know, on sites or, or use products where there's like an experimental, you know, beta test group that people try. There's like opt in features that, you know, may be included in later versions. We've all seen that stuff. And that's a, a solution, you know, to solving to, or at least to start getting out of technical debt because you have to do a slow rollout. But the slow rollout, it just, it, it sometimes it makes it worse in the beginning because now you have to set, um, manage two different things and two different paths in the code. And then you have all this branching logic and it becomes complicated. But I think up front, you have to suffer some of that necessary complexity in order to finally get off of the legacy code. Um, And I get that it adds to the overall cognitive load of the system. And that's a legitimate thing that should be tracked. Um, And yeah, if you have to do, if you have to have pages and pages of documentation of how to just run things locally and then do all this obscure things, then something needs to be done about that to improve the developer experience. We, it's if you've ever worked in modern systems, uh, or even you know it, it, even on your own projects to run it, you just hit F five, you know, and then it's 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 done. And it, if you have some obscure things like you have, I don't know, if you're using queues, if you're using any kind of cloud services. Um, and you've set it up right, you should be able to point to um, like a test environment or something like that. But if you ever worked in somewhere it's, that's easy to run locally with one button, and then you go from that to a headache of a, a massive legacy system that is it, it just doesn't run locally, it's, it, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. And that's what burns people out so quick is because your your job all of a sudden becomes not software engineering at all, but just configuration just to get the thing to run in the first place, let alone add to it. And it's it's so frustrating. Um, hopefully you're not in that environment, um, but I mean, we've all we've all been there working in that stuff. Um, but that should give us motivation to write clean systems moving forward. But stuff that's just, you know, stuff that's just easy, 
right? Just put clean logs in. Don't make the thing complicated if you can if you can avoid it. Just write write in plain, you know, right write in plain English in your system, right, of how how things are being handled and write stuff down. Right, you know. But again, sometimes we don't have a choice. We have to put in weird code to accommodate some weird edge case. Um, it's it's that's unavoidable. So anyway, I think on the next video, I really want to get into agile, so, <laughs> agile software development. Uh, but we'll talk about it in the next video. All right, I'll see you later.